Okay. Is still on Amen. The okay, so we're we're talking about Jesus' teachings. Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, true spirituality, how to live the spirit-filled life in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he taught that he is God. He's God the Son become a man. He is Savior, the only way for us to be saved. He is the Jewish Messiah, the one who's going to rescue Israel from her enemies. And then he taught that he will return. And we started that last week talking about what Jesus said about the second coming. Now, if you remember last week, I said that Jesus and the prophets throughout the scriptures, they make the end time prophecies so vague that each and every generation of Christians uh, from the start of the church till now, each and every generation uh, would think that Jesus could possibly return in our lifetime. Jesus wants us to live with that expectancy. You know, I think, I think mo most of us, we have an attitude, Jesus, I want you to return real quick, but, but not just yet. Because, uh, you know, I'm going to be buying that new car in a few weeks, or I just got promoted, or, you know, things are just going so well. Just give me, just give me another 10 or 20 years in my comfort zone or whatever. Um, but the end time prophecies are so vague that each and every generation would think that Jesus could possibly return in their lifetime. At the same time, Jesus makes the end time prophecies so specific that that last generation will reach a point where they will know for sure. Now, I wish I could tell you whether I knew if we were that last generation or not, okay? Um, but there are several things that are going on. We're going to see when Jesus says to head for the hills. Jesus tells us exactly when to head for the hills. Now, it's, it's a little bit late in the ball game at the point he tells me to head for the hills. He, I wish there was an extra passage for wimps like Phil Fernandez, you know, some, some indication 10 years earlier. Um, but we're going to see that um, with certain things, when they come down, it's, it's a pretty good indication. Um, that the time has come. Now, let me say this too. There are good Christian brothers and sisters that disagree about whether we, the church, true believers, about whether or not we're going to be here for the tribulation. I was trained by godly uh, theologians at Liberty University who believe that the church will be secretly snatched away by Jesus before the seven-year tribulation period. So there's some Christians who, who believe Godly men like like uh, like Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, um, that believe that the church will be removed before this stuff actually comes down. So things will be getting tougher, but before the seven-year tribulation period will be snatched away. Then there's others who believe that the tribulation period is really only three and a half years, and that Jesus is going to snatch us away three and a half years before his return. And then there's the view that I hold to um, called post-tribulationalism is that the church will go through the tribulation period. And um, this is a doctrine I hope I'm wrong on. Okay? I don't like pain. I, I, never, really, I never really did like pain. I think in, in boxing I started to, after a while, enjoy the, the smell of leather when I get hit. And that's when I realized it was, it was time to quit. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, I don't like pain. Um, my doctor in encouraged me to avoid it at all costs. So believe me, I'm, I'm the guy that wants to be wrong on this. Um, at the same time, what I would encourage you, if you disagree with me on this particular doctrine, just get things right with the Lord. Settle things with the Lord so that you are willing to suffer and die for Jesus. Because whether we go through the tribulation or not, there's a good chance we're going to be called to suffer and die for Jesus. Now, I've said this a hundred times. I'll say it thousands of times more before I see the Lord. And um, do not tell me you're willing to die for Jesus when things get bad if you're not willing to live for Jesus while things are going well. And, um, you know, I, I, if I had a dime for every guy who's, you know, claims to be a Christian, 
is getting drunk, is messing around, has got a foul mouth, but tells me he's going to be willing to die for Jesus when things get tough. And I just like, I just try not to laugh and I walk away. Um, but if you can't live for him when, when days are going well, what makes you think you're going to be willing to die for our king? Um, and so let's take a look at Matthew 24. So again, the end time prophecies... So vague, every generation would think that Jesus could return in their lifetime. By the way, there are some things that are coming down now that were not coming down in previous generations. Uh, for instance, a lot of Bibles. I love reading uh, Bible scholars who are premillennial. They believe Jesus would literally reign on earth for a thousand years after he returns. And I love reading their works of the 19, early 1940s because they would always say, you know, well, people are saying Hitler might be the Antichrist, the Mussolini, the false prophet, but this can't be so. And they would say, because Israel's not a nation. You know, I would read these books and I think, when was this written? I look in the copyright. I think a book of Dihon was uh, uh, 1946, two years before the Jews got their homeland back. So once 1948, your all Christians' eyes should get this big. And then they just start saying, okay, I need to read my Bible a lot closer right now. And in 1967, the Jews unified, took full control of Jerusalem, okay? Now, as, as I speak, our president is trying to put together a, a peace treaty. He's, he's referring to it as what, the final peace covenant. And he's trying to pressure Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the uh, Israeli prime minister, uh, to give in to this peace treaty. And... Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We'll see when things, when, when Jesus gives the green light, hey, it's time to flee, okay? Now, I want to look again at verse 14, though. And Jesus said, now, after he talked about false Christ and wars and rumors of wars and uh, earthquakes and famines and diseases and, um, and being hated by all nations for his namesake, by the way, it sure, sure sounds like that's the case right now. At least the governments of just about every nation on the planet Earth hates Jesus with a passion. And, um, um, and you got false prophets, lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. You know, I'm starting to think when we talk about the love of many growing cold, I often look at the population, like things like abortion, parents aborting their, their children before their children see the, the light of day. But it's, it's a, the love is growing cold among political leaders. Uh, when you look at what, what, what the movers and shakers in the United Nations circles, uh, what the Ted Turners of this world are saying, um, these guys openly say, and they, they get standing ovations, um, that they want to cut the world's population down to about half a billion, which is a problem because we're at seven billion right now. And then people say, oh, what a great man. What, the guy just said he wants to, you know, multiply... The, the murderous actions of Hitler and Stalin exponentially, and, uh, and we act like, oh, these guys are great guys. So, um, in fact, William Dembski, one speaker in Texas at the, the uh, some science society of Texas, a professor, talked about maybe we should spread a disease throughout the world and wipe out everybody but about half a billion people, and he received a standing ovation so this, this scientist who heard it got so upset. I think, I think William Dembski, he's a Christian. He teaches, uh, he's part of the intelligent design movement. Or he's that design shows the existence of an intelligent designer. And, uh, and Dem he, when he told Dembski, Dembski filed a report with the Department of Homeland Security. And they actually opened up a file on this professor. But, um, but if that's not the love of, of many growing cold, I don't know what is. But it says in verse 14... And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Remember, everything else is birth pains, increasing in frequency and intensity, but it's not the end. But verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus says the end is not going to come until the gospel's been preached to all the nations. Now, let me say this. What we call nations today the gospel has been preached to all nations, okay? 
At the same time, the word for nations in the Greek does not always mean what we call a nation. So you could have different people groups with different languages within a larger country, and it seems to me that the Bible would classify those people groups as separate tribes or separate nations, okay? So I, I don't think at this point, if you talk to New Tribes Missions, they'd say, no, the whole world has not yet been evangelized. New Tribes Missions and Wycliffe translators, they will translate the Bible into the language of the people. Now, the people groups that they're going to usually don't even have a written language. So they listen to their oral language, and then they invent an alphabet for them, and then invent a written language for them, and then start translating the Bible for them, okay? And so there's over, I think there's over 7,000 different people groups when you go by the different languages. And yet, uh, the Bible has been translated, I believe, in about 5,000, or at least portions of the Bible, to about 5,000 of those languages. And believe me, New Tribes Missions, Wycliffe Translators, they're working overtime uh, to reach all, all people with the gospel message. And so there are people... There are people who have never heard about Jesus. I was watching the Christian station on Saturday night and um, the Jesus film. The Jesus film, I believe, is based on the Gospel of Luke, 1970s. Um, we Americans usually don't watch it because it, it, it doesn't look anywhere near as, as the special effects in, like, The Passion or something. But for people who've never seen a movie before and have never seen a movie in their own language, they're translating that and they're getting that out to people groups. And I was watching on television an Af African tribal people and um, how these people were weeping when Jesus was crucified and weeping and wailing, men, women, and children. And then when he rose from the dead, they were standing up and cheering. And, and it's not uncommon for an entire tribe to accept Christ as Savior when they see this. And, um, and so we may not even have to translate the entire Bible all nations. We might just have to do something like the Jesus film and translate it to the languages of these other people. Uh, but that is right on the horizon. And that's why we need to support ministries like New Tribe Mission, uh, New Tribes Missions, as they get the word out. But Jesus tells us, I'm not going to come back until my gospel has been preached to all nations. Well, we are almost there. And praise God. And let me tell you, don't ever let me hear anybody who calls himself a Christian, saying, well, let's slow that process down so we'll delay you. No, no. The gospel's got to go. The God, whether, whether we're going to be here or we're going to be in the air, um, the gospel's got to be preached to all mankind. Where would you be without the good news of salvation? Through Jesus. I know where I'd be, okay? And it wouldn't be here right now. And, um, and, so, and did, did, did you deserve it? No. Do I deserve Jesus? No. Well, they don't deserve me either, but if, if we got the good news of salvation, I want every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth to hear the good news of salvation through my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so this is coming very, very, coming very close to, with the kind of technology we got, you know, with technology increasing, increasing, they could just figure out a way, and boom, it's done. And so we're getting very, very close. Now Jesus says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet uh, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea, the southern region of Israel, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened... No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So let's take a look at that. Jesus says that there's this going, going to be this abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. 
and then you know the end has come. Right? This is Jesus who said, you know, Jesus is fully man and fully God. He chose not to tap into his divine powers for his advantage, but learned the same way that we learn, and then he just depended upon the Father and let the Father decide what supernatural wisdom he would have while on earth. He did not use his divine nature to his advantage. And so he told the apostles he did not know the day or the hour of his return. Now if you read Acts chapter 1 real closely, Jesus now knows the day or the hour of his return. And then when they asked him, tell us when you're going to come back and establish God's kingdom, and he basically told them, it's way above your pay scale. It's none of your business, guys. All you need to know about is that the Holy Spirit's going to come about come upon you and empower you to be my witnesses. You need to be busy that, but I'm not going to tell you. So it seems to me that Jesus knew. Um, by the time he rose from the dead, um, then uh, the kenosis, um, him humbling himself and, and veiling uh, himself uh, um, to become a man and, and lowering himself, that that was over at that point, and then Jesus knew the exact day and the hour of his return. Uh, but here's Jesus telling us, don't be picking dates, but then he tells us, now when you see this happen, head for the hills. Okay? Um, and so this is the indication, the abomination of desolation standing in, in the uh, holy place. And then we'll begin a, the, the worst period in the history of mankind referred to as the great uh, tribulation. So what is the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. He, he said it's what Daniel talked about. So let's take a look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. In fact, before we turn to Daniel chapter 9, look at Daniel 11.31. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now there's a debate about whether that's the Antichrist or an evil Syrian leader who is kind of a, a foreshadowing of the Antichrist, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, who went into the temple, slaughtered a pig in the temple, um, uh, demanded that he be worshipped, set up a statue of a false uh, uh, Greek god in the temple, and the Maccabees had a fight, and this was like 165 years before Jesus walked the earth. And so there's uh, at least, at the very least, a type of the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation basically means the disgusting thing that lays waste or makes desolate. So it's something that, dis that is disgusting, that destroys everything that you want built up, okay? Um, it's a pretty strong language, okay? And, um, uh, but there's Antiochus Epiphanes. But in chapter 12, verse 11, it's definitely talking about the end time resurrection. You just read earlier in that chapter, and the resurrection to eternal life, the resurrection to eternal contempt of the lost, and then, Revel and then uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 says, and from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, that's when the Antichrist is going to put an end to the sacrifices in the rebuilt temple, and the abomin abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. That's the last three and a half year period of what's commonly called the tribulation period. The last three and a half years plus 30 days. But there is this abomination of desolation that Daniel is talking about. And Jesus says, I'm talking about that as well. Um, and then look back on Daniel 9.27. Really, really difficult passage. You could Entire books have been written on Daniel 9.24 to 27. The uh, Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. In Hebrew, a week just means a seven, so it's 70 sevens. 
and it can refer to a week of seven days or a week of seven years. When you check out these, this prophecy, it makes no sense if it's uh, weeks of, of days. When you make it weeks of years, it, it gives you from the order, the decree to rebuild the, the temple and the walls. I think it was approximately 444 B.C. And you take the first 69 weeks of years, 483 years from that order, then Messiah comes. And uh, J. Alva McLean did some research, and he found that it closes on the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, proclaiming himself without words to be the Messiah. To the exact day, the unveiling of who the Messiah is. And so that's already been fulfilled, those 483 years. The last seven years for Israel, to complete Israel's history, we're in a gap. This says, and after the, the 69th week, after the 483 years, Messiah has to be cut off and have nothing. Messiah has to be executed. Then the people of the prince who is to come have to come and destroy the temple and destroy the city. Okay, so well, that happened in 70 AD, so you got longer than seven years. So we know that we are in a gap. Some refer to this gap as the church age. Okay, uh, but at the end of this gap, all of a sudden, Israel's going to be back on the clock. Back on the prophetic clock. And a peace treaty will be signed. This is why we need to read our newspapers and, and look on the internet and, and try to keep track of these things that are coming down um, in Israel. And, um, and so look at Daniel 9.27. Now he's talking about that last week of seven years. And it says, uh, then he... And, and, and most expositors believe that he there refers to the prince who is to come. And the, the people of the prince who is to come, they were the Romans. So I tend to favor the view that the Antichrist himself will be uh, a European and could come out of the European Union. But it says, then he, the prince who is to come, shall confirm a covenant, a peace agreement, with many for one week. That's the seven years. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So he'll put an end to the animal sacrifice. Well, they're not going on right now because there's no temple. So I think part of the peace treaty is going to be uh, the agreement to allow the Jews to rebuild the temple, probably right alongside the Dome of the Rock. Because if you blow up the Dome of the Rock, World War III starts. I think World War III is going to start without blowing up the dome, but don't. But I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I'm by nature pessimistic. So, um, but, uh, but whatever the case, you could build a temple right alongside there, and that may be in part of the provisions of this covenant. That he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So we know that sacrifice has to be restarted. The temple has to be rebuilt. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. And there you have it again. Even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So let's go back now to Matthew 24. So this disgusting thing that lays waste, this abomination of desolation. So what you have to have here, before the tribulation can start, you've got to have this seven-year peace treaty and then there's got to be a rebuilding of the temple and a reinstitution of the temple sacrifices because then halfway through that seven year period, that's when the abomination of desolation is in the holy place and then Jesus says to head for the hills. Now, um, you don't have, we don't have a lot to go on here with this disgusting thing that makes, that destroys or makes desolate. Unless we look at the example from Antiochus Epiphanes, um, you can see how he desecrated the temple. Went into the Holy of Holies and slaughtered a pig, which is an unclean animal. He was not even supposed to eat pork, let alone bring a pig into the temple, and then slaughter it in the Holy of Holies. And then he sets up a statue of a false god. So that gives us an idea. Now, was, maybe, maybe Jesus was talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. No! 
That was 165 years earlier. In fact, at that point in Jesus' life, it was almost 200 years earlier. So he couldn't have been talking about him. And it wasn't, it wasn't 70 AD with the Romans. The Romans leveled the temple and stuff, uh, but they didn't do anything nearly as crazy as what Antiochus Epiphanes did. Um, so uh, we're looking for something like that, a seven-year peace treaty, uh, the sacrifices being reoffered, and then in the middle, the one who signed the peace treaty then puts a stop to the sacrifices and does something totally blasphemous and horrific, okay? So without using the words abomination and desolation, we, by the grace of God, have two chapters that spell out the details of what the abomination of desolation will entail. Revelation chapter 13 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay? And so let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what the Apostle Paul tells us about this. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. See, the, the, these guys, somebody came by and said, hey, I got a letter from the apostles saying the day of the Lord's already come. You guys missed it. Okay? And, um, and, and Paul, Paul's saying, in fact, some guys even quit work because they believe the day of the Lord had come. So Paul has to say, if any man will not work, neither let him eat. So he's going to say, come on. And, and by the way, that's good advice for us. Let's say you come out of these sermons today and you think, wow, I... I think Pastor Phil pointed out some things that when I read the newspaper, um, I think the end is near. I'm going to quit my job and um, move up in the hills and this. And I mean, yeah, by the way, if you want to do that and get away from everybody, more power to you. Um, if uh, my thermostat goes below 70, I, I immediately go into a comatose state, so I can't handle the outdoors. But, but if you want to do that, that's, that's fine. But, but don't do it because... You think I'm telling you that? Paul's saying, "No, you got you know." So, so we we got to live each and every moment as if we're going to live to be 120 years old. You got. I, I hope you're you're numbering your days and trying to figure out your life expect. I try to figure out my life expectancy, and it's somewhere between uh, 50 and 100 years for me, because my mother's side of the family, um, I'm Methuselah right now. Okay. My father's side of the family, I'm just a kid, okay? But try to figure out, you know, how much time do I have on this planet because I'm living on this planet not for myself. I'm property of Jesus. I'm not here to build my own kingdom. I'm here to build his kingdom. And I want to know how long I got. Because I want to, I want to plan things out. I don't want to be like the guy who just, just you know, he shoots off the hip all the time, doesn't know whether he's coming or going. And so, uh, through prayer and through trying to figure out how long I could possibly live, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, well, well, I think God wants me to accomplish this and this time through His grace and His power, and He wants me to do this. And we we try to figure out. We, me and Pat Fisk will sit down and John and try to figure out. How can we reach more people? Okay? We, you know, it's just like I, people, he, he, he puts out the sermons. I think last week I talked about how small our church is. And so I got hit with a whole bunch of emails and Facebook guys saying, saying, dude, your church is a lot bigger, a lot bigger than what you got there because there's guys that watch us live or watch us uh, a little bit later because Pat works hard. He puts them up. By Monday, this stuff is on and out there. But we're trying to reach more people. So, so I'm, I'm not acting. So, so the, the thing is, you've got you to gotta plan out your life as if you're going to live to be 120. 
at the same time, you got to be try to be so close to the Lord that if he came back today, you would not be ashamed to be in the presence of your king. And there's a balance in a Christian life. And these guys that are just quitting their jobs and stuff like that, uh, that they didn't have that balance. Okay? Uh, now, Jesus does tell us when to head for the hills. A little bit late in the ball game for, for Phil Fernandez, but uh, he does tell us at that halfway point, you know, no if, what's, or buts about it. This is it. Head for the hills. Now, if there's a seven-year peace treaty signed, and, um, and they start rebuilding the temple, man, I'm making provisions. In fact, uh, I think you ought to make provisions right now, by the way, just because for all you know, there's going to be an earthquake. And, um, and maybe the Red Cross isn't going get to get to you for uh, a couple weeks or a month. or so. We could have an economic crash. You know, families all over this country and all over the world, they have economic crashes all the time. You know why? Because they get into debt. And they get into debt over their head. And then once they reach that point where they can't even afford to pay the interest on their debt, they cave in. Well, our government's pretty much... For all practical purposes, we pretty, we're pretty much there, except the only difference is the government has the quote-unquote authority to print more money. So they're putting, it's kind of like, don't think of America economically right now as like we're standing at the edge of a cliff and, and about to, to fall off, but we could just step back. Think about it, we already fell off the cliff, okay? But what our government has, unlike, unlike our families, our government has the ability uh, to kind of move the ground lower and lower. <laughs> and so, be, be, so they're, they're basically you know, prolonging the point at which we're going to crash, but we're going to crash. I mean, just read history. This happened in Germany, it happened in countries in, in Central and South America, uh, it happened in African countries, and, um, and so that's just around the corner. And, and that's even if we're not living in the last days. So you ought to prepare for a rainy day. But these guys in Thessalonica, you know, there were some guys acting like, okay, well, I'm just going to quit my job and all. And so Paul says, so, so, so here guys were deceiving them, saying the day of the Lord has already come. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The apostasy of the church... Uh, and the man of sin, see, in the last days, what is, what is going to be called the organized church isn't really going to be the true church at all. We, we look at that, and, and Roman Catholicism has twisted so many of, of God's teachings and blended some paganism in with the Word of God. And then you have mainline denominations, which sometimes are more New Age than anything else, but I don't know what they are, but it's not Christian, some of them. And, um, and there's a remnant both within the mainline denominations and in uh, evangelical churches and non-denominational churches. There is a remnant, but we're seeing this, this falling away uh, of the faith. No, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition. So now he's going to talk about this disgusting one. Okay? who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he's going to go into God's temple and proclaim himself to be God. You realize how humble Jesus was when he came to earth? Here he is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, becomes a man, visits his people, and you got some high priest guy that doesn't even believe that once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur goes into the Holy of Holies and offers a sacrifice for the Jewish nation. Uh, did Jesus have the right to walk into the Holy You better believe it. He created the universe. Yet Jesus never once walked into the Holy of Holies. He was very humble. You know, John Stott says that, said that the late uh, British theologian and pastor, that Jesus goes down in history as one of the hum most humblest men who ever lived, yet he made the boldest claims that any man ever made. And that's an indication that he was who he actually claimed he was. Um, uh, if Jesus had gone into the Holy of Holies, the, the Jews would have killed him right on the spot. They would have just said, no, this is just too much. 
we've got too much respect for the God of, of Israel that we're going to allow some guy who's not the high priest to walk into the Holy Holies. That would have just blown them away. Jesus was very gentle. Even when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. Believe me, he's being gentle. Because he could have shouted that from inside the Holy of Holies if he wanted to. Yet this guy, there's going to be a leader. The people are going to say, man, this whole world's about to blow up. Except for this guy. He's the one. He is the one. And then he's going to go into the Holy of Holies and proclaim himself to be God. And, and that's when, but by the way, until that point, many of the Jews are going to follow him and think that he is their Messiah. But once he goes into the Holy of Holies and proclaims himself to be God, the abomination of desolation, um, they're going to realize he's, he's not the one. He's a blasphemer. And, um, and then Jesus says that's the time to flee. So the, the, the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I agree um, with, with many Christians that that's the Holy Spirit has to come out of the way. I don't think it means the evacuation of the planet Earth by the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit is still going to be here and still going to be working. Um, but it means the Holy Spirit is blocking the Antichrist from being revealed. Once the Holy Spirit moves out of the way and stops blocking him, then the Antichrist is going to be uh, revealed. And then verse 8, And then the lost one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is, is according to the working of Satan with all powers, signs, and lying wonders. Here's where I have a disagree with one of my old rabbis, Dr. Norman Geisler, brilliant, apologist, but he believes that the Antichrist and the false, he believes only God can perform miracles. Any other supernatural works is all involves sleight of hand. But the same words in the Bible for God's miracles, those same words are used of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and, uh, and other demonic uh, uh, sorcerers uh, throughout the scriptures. Signs, wonders, powers, okay? The same words. So I believe they'll be real super. Well, what makes their miracles counterfeit is not that they're not supernatural. What makes their, them counterfeit is that they're not for, from God and they claim that they're from God. But they're actually supernatural works. Believe me, um, Tal Brook uh, for the Spiritual Counterfeits Project, before he became a Christian, he was the leading Western disciple of Sai Baba a power guru out of India. And, and th this guy, you just listen to his stuff and he'll tell you the kind of crazy supernatural stuff that it occurs in the, the higher levels of, of Hindu uh, power gurus and in the, the New Age movement and things of that sort. Yeah, nine out of ten times when somebody's claiming supernatural power, it's bogus. But I'm talking about the one out of ten times when it's not bogus. Okay? Now the Bible says, greater is he who is in you. And he was in the world. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit don't back down from nobody. Okay? Right now, apologetics, I'll go to a college campus, I'll debate an atheist. Okay? Ten years apologetics is going to be, you know, casting demons out of somebody. It's going to be power encounters like we see on the mission field between missionaries and shamans. Okay? Uh, apologetics 10 years from now is just going to be boldly proclaiming my God is bigger than your God okay the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he don't take a back seat to nobody okay my God he was born in a manger little lowly baby but my God is the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords uh, but if you think 
that the de demonic realm doesn't have power, uh, you better think again. Our God is all powerful, but there is power in the world uh, of the occult. Um, and so it's, it talks about the signs and wonders, the working of Satan with all power of signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You see, God is going to wait till the gospel message is preached to all nations, and, and those who are going to fall for the lie are those who've rejected the truth. Whenever you reject the truth, you'll be vulnerable to, the, to a lie. Verse 11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay? Now, let me, let me say something here. Could Paul be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes? No. Because Antiochus Epiphanes died about 200 years, lived about 200 years earlier. But, but this is still, Paul's writing this. Paul died in 67 AD. The Romans destroyed the temple in, in uh, 70 AD. So maybe Paul's talking about uh, uh, the Romans coming in. Um, the f fact of the matter is, look, you, you gotta, we, we really got to take God's, we have to take God's word seriously. It says, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Whoever Paul's talking about, this man of sin, this lawless one, this antichrist, it's not him unless he gets defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. So we got a lot of brothers and sisters in the Lord who try to dance around this and say, well, he's not really saying that. Yes, he is really saying that. Okay? Uh, one of the scariest chapters in the Bible, Zechariah chapter 11, talks about the Jews rejecting the good shepherd, and then God says, okay, pay me what you think I'm worth. And this is 400 years before Jesus walked the earth. So the Jews said, okay, and they gave him 30 pieces of silver. What is that talking about? But then because they reject the good shepherd, God will send to them the worthless shepherd. Okay? And, um, and, and that's what Paul is talking about. The coming of the, the lawless one, the man of sin. You know, we had th this planet, not just the Jews, but the entire world had its visitation. Its visitation from God 2,000 years ago. God became one of us. You know, my, my sister Marie really likes the song, says, what, what if God were one of us? And I can't, she want, always wants me to listen to it. And it's like, I don't want to listen to it, because he did become one of us. You know, and uh, um, we had our visitation from God. And you know what we did? Just like the Jews, we rejected him. And now we're going to get the visitation of the imposter. Satan himself incarnate. It's not only Satan that's going to indwell the Antichrist, but one of his high-ranking demons that's been locked up in the abyss. He's the beast that comes out of the abyss. And then one passage in Revelation says that three spirits come out of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon who is Satan. Three spirits come out like frogs, and they're, they're unclean spirits. So uh, the Antichrist himself is going to be indwelled not just by Satan, but by a high-ranking uh, demon as well. And um, now, I don't want to rush through Revelation 13, so we'll, we'll pick it up there next week, but I, I do want to close with, a, with another passage. But, but keep in mind, so Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, and I'm talking about what Daniel was talking about, it's time to flee, okay? So what we know is you've got to have a seven-year peace treaty signed, the temple's got to be rebuilt. The temple sacrifices are being reoffered, and then the Antichrist puts an end to that and goes into the temple, and proclaims himself to be God. When we read Revelation 13, we'll find some more factors involved with that. An image of the Antichrist is going to be built at that point. The mark of the beast is going to be uh, instituted. But what Jesus tells uh, his people there is that flee. At that point, it is so late in the game uh, that you should not get anything from your house. Don't waste time. Then he says, woe to those who are pregnant or those who have small children. 
Now, I've never been pregnant, okay? But I've been told that if a lady is pregnant, you're not going to be able to move around as quickly as you would when you were not pregnant, okay? So Jesus is saying speed is going to be important here. It is time to get out of town. You can't waste time. And then if you, if you have small children, it's going to be difficult, okay? I mean, running a 100-yard dash is difficult, but running a 100-yard dash with an infant in your arms, that's going to be even more difficult. And, um, and then he says, pray that your flight is not in winter. I don't need any commentary on that. Like I say, you know, if I'm, if I'm outside, it, you, when, when I, we used to play tackle football without pads, and I never got hurt when I was growing up in New Jersey. And I, was, I graduated high school, I weighed 125 pounds. So I was fighting as a featherweight at the time. So I was just a little guy, and I was playing with big guys, double my weight. But I'm telling you, I was such a wimp in the cold. I mean, it'd be no, late November, and I'd wear three sweatshirts and then a zip-up jacket and a wool hat and gloves. Um, I probably had more protection than most guys in the NFL have. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I get what Jesus is saying. Pray that your flight is not in winter, okay? And um, believe me, I was... Just getting out of my heated car to get into my heated house, I got to walk like 30 feet. And I was shivering one day, just about a month ago. And I thought, Lord, Lord, if we, if we got to go through the tribulation, man, I'm going to be the first one to die. You know, it's just like, yeah, the weather dropped below 30. Fernandez is dead. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, an in, I'm a city boy. I'm an indoor guy, man. I just, you know, crank up the, we used to sit on radiators back in Jersey. I'll be looking for one of them in the wilderness someday. Uh, pray that your flight is not in winter or on a Sabbath. Jesus loved to, to stick it to the, the Pharisees. Um, you know, God's word said rest on the Sabbath day. Set it apart for the Lord. Rest on the Sabbath day. And so these guys, in their commentaries, really big on rules and regulations. They tell you exactly how many feet you're allowed to travel on the Sabbath day without breaking the Sabbath law. They say you could travel X amount of feet. But then what would happen is another important rabbi would say, hey, we've got to have an important meeting. And these guys say, great, but the only time we're free is on the Sabbath. I wish I had an extension. And then they came up with a rule where they could, you, you could take a piece of your clothing and put it down and put a rock down, and then you get the extension. Like Let's say, let's say it was like 100 feet you can get a 100-foot extension every time you do this. So what they do is they get an old cloak and tear off pieces and then put a rock down and give himself extension after extension after extension. And Jesus is saying, man, with the, with the lousy teaching you guys and gals are getting from your rabbis, you better pray it's not on a Sabbath day. But you, you, you ain't got time to put down little pieces uh, of cloth and a rock on top of it every 200 feet or whatever it is, Okay. But Jesus is getting the point across. When this comes down, flee. I'm telling you, gee, you know, this was at a time when you didn't own your own Bible. You didn't own your own scrolls. We own our own Bibles, okay? B believe me, you're going to want a Bible in your car. You're going to want a Bible in your house and stuff. Because you know, Jesus doesn't even say, you know, you got time to go pick up your Bible and that's it. Memorize scriptures, study the scriptures. The day may come, you may not even have. You know, Corey Ten Boom talks about how valuable getting a, just a page of scripture was when she was in a concentration camp put there uh, by the Nazis. So flee to the mountains uh, because it's the worst time in human history, the Great Tribulation, and uh, no one would survive if the days were not cut short by Jesus' return. In other words, when Jesus returns... If he returned any later, the whole planet would blow itself up, okay? And, um, and, and by the way, I think that's another sign that we could be getting close. Mankind, j just since the, the, the close of World War II, right in there to about the late 1960s, mankind developed enough technology and ammunition to blow this planet up. And when I read the pages of history, 
It's not just my faith in God that tells me we could be getting close. It's my lack of faith in man. Every bit of hardware for evil that man has had, he has eventually used. Every potential for devastation, he has eventually used, which tells me that someday we're going to use the stuff we got. The nukes, the chemical weapons, um, and the list goes on and on. And, um, and, and that tells me that we could be very clear. But if Jesus does not return to cut things short at that point, uh, no flesh would be saved. And, um, and now what I want to do is just go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we'll just close with this today, and then we'll pick it up there next week. We'll take a look at Revelation chapter 13. But look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 3 to 9, he says this, Knowing this first, that scoffers, some translations read mockers, scoffers will come in the last days, walking around, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's what evolutionists call uniformitarianism. No miracles, all the processes that are going on today have been going on throughout all time, according to evolutionists, except when they find something that doesn't fit in and they have to admit, and uh, the whole principle should be thrown out. But basically what they're saying is, look, there's never, throughout all history, there's never been a miracle. Why should we believe in the second coming of Christ? What they do is, it's kind of like if you deny, if you ignore all the evidence for miracles, then yeah. There's no evidence for miracles. But I question, why would you deny all the evidence for miracles? But they say, well, you know, they come mocking, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Verse 5, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and, by, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. In other words, if you didn't, these people are ignoring that that the universe was created by God and they're ignoring the global flood so it makes it very easy for them to say nothing out of the ordinary ever occurs. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So basically the ancient world was judged by water. Our present age is going to be judged by fire. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And so he's basically, he's basically saying the Lord is not late, the Lord is not slow. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all uh, should come to repentance. Why is he taking Jesus, O Lord? To come back because he loves us. If Jesus came back right now, there would be people who might get saved two months from now that would be eternally lost. And so because Jesus loves us, um, he's put off his return until that point. Uh, the Bible says that when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then all Israel will be saved and the veil will be removed in the eyes of the Jews. God knows what he's doing. And, uh, and by the way, there are a lot of theologians who, who teach that the apostles thought Jesus would return in their lifetime. But let me tell you, um, there is ample evidence both before Christ from the Jewish rabbis and after Christ, like in the Epistle of Barnabas and other ancient Christian writings by credible Christian leaders that many, many leaders in the early church were not expecting Jesus to return for approximately 2,000 years. Okay? It was old, the old Jewish tradition that just as God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, God will allow man to rule himself for 6,000 years, but then Messiah will come and reign 
for a thousand years. And, um, and then John talks about the thousand year reign of Christ. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic on any of that, but what I, what I am saying is that the early church understood that Jesus' return could be far off. Okay? Um, but Peter says in the last days there'll be mockers. Are there mockers right now? You better believe it. You better believe it. The Richard Dawkins of this world that call teaching children about God child abuse. And I've heard Dawkins taunt the Christian he was debating because, hey, I, what, did he, what did he ask you, you, at in a radio interview? He said, you don't, you, you don't honestly believe that, that uh, Jesus turned water into wine, do you? And he, you, you had said, yes, I do. He said, oh, come on, really now? And by, by the way, so if some of us here deny Christ, it'll be more the tone of the people who are interrogating us, it will not be the, the logic of their thought. It'll just be, the most, a lot of us could just crumble just if the tone is right. That's why kids lose their faith in college, because of the tone of the professor. The last days, there's going to be mockers. The world can mock. The world is mocking us. The world is laughing at us. The world thinks we're fools uh, because we're gathering right here. Um, Peter said the last day there will be mockers, but our message for them, the world can mock, but he will come. Richard Dawkins can mock and laugh. Political leaders can mock and laugh. The United Nations can mock and laugh. That's not gonna change the truth. Brothers and sisters, he will come. Our king promised us that he will come. And he's going to come and, and defeat the enemies of Israel and the enemies of the church, and he's going to come and he's going to rescue his people. But I don't care if the powers that, that be. If they want to mock us, go ahead. Jesus promised we would be mocked. But the fact of the matter is, he will come.